If you're like me, you've often wondered why certain compost works better than others. Well, in today's video, we're gonna get into composting 101. I'm going to talk about all the different types of compost. Yes, there are more than one type of compost. And then I'm also going to show you how I actually make compost here at my place. And with that in mind, you may be wondering what this giant pile is right here. Well, this is three cubic yards of compost that I picked up locally. And so today, let's talk about what makes this compost good and what makes other compost more troubling and how to get the most out of your compost. There are four different major types of compost. There's inoculating, fertilizing, nutritional, and mulching. This right here is something that I would consider an example of a nutritional compost. And the reason why I'd call it nutritional is because it's actually a 50-50 blend of green waste compost, which is like, you know, something like you would make at home, just greens and browns. And then it's also cut 50-50 with a 100% organic manure-based compost. So that manure-based compost is made with uh, dairy manure, if I recall. And the nice thing about it is, first of all, it's organic, which I love to get whenever I can. But the manure actually has a ton of nutrients, and it's really good for soil life. And manure tends to be a little hot, and when I say hot, I mean it can be very high in nitrogen and it can actually burn the plants. So the reason why this is a 50-50 blend is because they wanted to temper that manure base in the original compost. By being a nutritional compost, whenever I add this to the garden, I'm getting a lot of different benefits. I'm getting the benefits of the manure, which is acting as some sort of level of fertilizer. And I'm also getting the benefit of all the greens and browns. So all this together, is going to form the perfect thing for supporting soil food web life. And really what we're going for when we're doing organic gardening or organic farming is we're trying to feed the soil so that the soil in turn can feed the plants for us rather than having to rely on chemical fertilizers. So I will mention that this, I think I mentioned at the beginning actually that I bought this as three cubic yards originally. That's an important thing to note is that if you've read the Grow Biointensive book by John Jevons, one of the things, he's a huge proponent of compost, but one of the things he mentions is that it's literally physically impossible to produce as much compost as you need for your garden. So every once in a while, you're going to have to buy some compost. If you guys follow somebody like Charles Dowding, then you know that even he buys compost and he makes massive quantities of compost. So don't feel discouraged if you feel like you need to go buy compost. It's not bad. It's just something that needs to happen every once in a while. And the nice thing about compost is that it's taking waste, whether that's yard waste from like say clipping these bushes behind me, and it's combining it with dead material to create nutrition. And that's kind of one of the most beautiful things because you're closing the loop on green waste and you're actually giving something that benefits your garden. While we're sitting here on this pile, I'll mention you'll see that some, of the, some parts of the pile look dark, some parts of it look lighter color. And the reason why it's dark is because I've been watering it. Whenever you have a large pile of compost like this, you want to make sure that you water it every once in a while. And the reason why you want to water it is because if it becomes too dry, if it becomes like bone bone dry, um, many of you have probably experienced this with peat, but when organic matter tends to dry out, it can actually become hy hydrophobic. So that means it's going to be scared or repel water. So it's important to make sure that you're maintaining some level of moisture in your pile. I'm probably gonna water this once a week, um, or maybe I'll use it all before then. I have a lot of garden refreshing that I need to do. But yeah, it's nice to have good compost you could get locally. If you can find it organic, go for it. If you can't, you know, do the best that you can. But it's really nice to have as much compost as you need. It makes gardening a lot easier. Compost type number two, fertilizing. What you see here is a big plate of composted chicken manure. Now, uh, you'll know, I didn't say a hot plate <laughs> because this is composted chicken manure. Now, it is really important to mention that if you are buying a manure-based amendment, like a chicken manure, you really do wanna make sure that it is composted. Uncomposted manures are what are considered hot. They still have a lot of microbial action. They're still breaking down because they're still fresh. So usually it takes you know, six months to a year to be composted entirely. And you could tell that this is composted because it has all these little woody bits in there. And there's nothing really discernible in terms of manure or anything like that in here. Now, one other thing you might notice is that you're picking up a smell of ammonia. And that makes sense because ammonia is a form of nitrogen. So 
all that checks out. It's not really the most pleasant part. So let's get into what a composted chicken manure is in terms of a fertilizer. So composted chicken manure, you can look up online. It ranges anywhere of like an end number of six to four. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and call it a 422 in terms of a fertilizer. So imagine if you had a organic granular fertilizer. Those are usually in the range of something like 422, 433, etc. If you were to go build a garden bed, you wouldn't go and put two inches of organic fertilizer on top. So it's the same idea with a fertilizing compost. It's something that you use sparingly as needed. So for instance, if I am planting corn, I do like to reach for the composted chicken manure because chicken manure tends to be high in nitrogen. But otherwise, I might add a little bit on top of the surface of a bed and then try to rake it in. But I'm not going to go ahead and build an entire bed out of it. So that's kind of the main distinction of a fertilizing compost. It's something that you use sparingly and it's something that's very high in nutrition comparatively. All right, so I'm on the floor here for you guys. Uh, but we're going to talk about compost type number three, which is a mulching type compost. So if you look around here, you could probably see already the top of this bed here has a lot of these really woody bits. So that's something that would be closer towards a mulch. It is still a compost because it is a mixture of greens and browns, um, but you'll find that mulching compost tend to have a lot of more big woody material in there. So things like municipal compost, I would classify sort of more towards a mulching compost. It's not gonna be very nutritionally heavy, like the one that I showed earlier that has a little bit of manure added in, but they still do serve a great purpose. Uh, for one thing is they're easier to come by and the other nice thing about them is that really you could add as much as you want anywhere and you're not going to really kill plants by burning them. You're not going to over fertilize. So they do have a purpose. It's one of those things that you'll often see in a like no-till garden bed design is you could add you know sometimes four, six, eight inches of this kind of compost on top and then plant right into it. Now, do keep in mind that if you are using a mulching compost, you are going to want to amend it. So you're gonna to wanna to add either some sort of composted manure or some organic-based fertilizer. That's really all I wanted to say about a mulching style of compost. One thing you'll note is that this kind of woody material, like if you do bury this too much, you will have some sort of nitrogen lockout. So you do wanna make sure that you're staying on top of your fertility. Um, other than that, it is something that's very useful to have. It's something that I would actually consider putting in my pathways because it will actually reduce the water use and it will still provide some sort of fungal and soil microbe um, hotel, <laughs> for lack of better terms. So plenty of reasons to use it, but it's not the first thing I'm gonna reach for if I'm gonna be building a new garden bed. I'm going to lean towards that nutritional compost. So this beautiful structure made out of pallets here is my finishing compost bin. So what I mean by finishing compost bin is I start all my compost in these green yard waste bins and I kind of let it cold compost. I don't really pay much attention to it. Once they entirely fill up, I actually move them over here and I'll let it sit for another three to six months. Now that last bit of three to six months is where all the magic happens. So in my green bins, there's tons of really coarse straw but you could see that once I'm at this stage here, and I should note, this is from the end of summer, I'd say probably July um, was the last addition I really added here, and it's all gone. It's all been broken down. There's really not much discernible. That's kind of one of the definitions for when compost is finished is, if you take a handful and look at it, can you identify any of the bits in there? And honestly, I can't. The only thing I can identify is straw. The other thing is, when you take it, and take a nice whiff of it, it should smell good. And actually it does smell good. It doesn't smell weird, doesn't smell bad, doesn't smell like something that's been sitting wet for too long and it just kind of rotted. It has this kind of pleasant earthy smell to it. And that is really perfect. So now what I could do is I could take all this compost here, which was filled up to here. So now it's dropped by half in volume and that's after it's already been initially composted. So it's just something to consider actually, quick caveat, is that when you're building your compost piles, what you see isn't what you get. What you get is at the end of that six month road, <laughs> usually half the pile that you started with. Now I did mention at the beginning that there are four different types of compost. I would maybe consider homemade compost type number five. I don't really know where to classify it. I'd say it's probably somewhere between inoculating because it is normally quite alive. It's for instance gonna be way more alive than anything I could get from my local municipality. Um, I wouldn't really call it fertilizing because there's no manures in here, but I might call it nutritious and inoculating. And that's because 
there's quite a lot of nutritional matter left in that huge pile of greens that I added, all those tomato plants, they have been sucking up nitrogen the whole season. It's not just like um, the municipal compost, which is just a random collection of greens that are collected from people's yards. I know what's in here. It's a mixture of mostly plants that I grow here. So that's great. Um, I'll say that homemade compost is probably some of the best stuff you could get. But like I said at the beginning, there is a caveat that you'll never be able to produce as much compost as you need. So anything that you do produce, just treat it as a bonus. I'm going to use this as maybe like a half inch topper to my beds. And then the bulk of my beds are gonna be built with the compost that I purchased. Before we move on to the next thing, I just found something cool I wanted to show you guys. This is an avocado pit. So this is something that we stopped putting in our compost. It's not really something you should add, but when you have a lot of people, you never know what's gonna end up in there. Now, it's pretty cool is that this is actually broken down quite a bit. Some sort of creature has been burrowing and tunneling through it. So even something like a avocado pit eventually will be broken down into nothing. So compost is really a beautiful thing. Compost type number four, an inoculating compost. This is the good stuff. So what is an inoculating compost? Uh, an inoculating compost is something that is so dense in life. And when I say life, I mean things like fungi, bacteria, archaea, amoeba, nematodes, any sort of protozoa, anything that's beneficial to your soil food web is going to be packed in here. Now, when you think of something like inoculating, what that usually means is that it's inoculated with that material. And that, in this case, it is. So this five gallon bag is absolutely loaded in fungal life, among other things. So this is sent over to me by Andy from SD Microbes. It's a local company. It's actually going to be the first company that I'm doing a little affiliate partnership with. So we'll hook you guys up with a little discount if you guys are curious in this. But basically the main idea here is that you take this five gallon bag of inoculating compost and then you could use it in teas or extracts or just straight up to inoculate your bigger compost pile. So this five gallon bag here, I could in theory use to inoculate that entire three cubic yard compost that I purchased. So while this is a lot more expensive than any other compost you could buy, the way you use it is that you stretch it by getting all that life and transporting that into a, or not transporting it, magnifying it into a much bigger sense. I'm gonna take this five gallon bag, and I don't know how much of it I'm actually going to use, but I'm going to go ahead and inoculate my entire compost pile with it. Beyond that, I'm also going to use it to inoculate any of my garden with it. The way you could do that is by, by either making the tea or extract, you could just water your garden directly with it. You could put some in the planting hole as you're transplanting. You could also take your transplant, dip it in that liquid before you plant it. And the basic idea is that this has so much life in it that that liquid is going to carry a very significant amount of it. And whenever you spread that liquid, then that's going to propagate and further spread that inoculation. So the way you use this is really sparingly. It's like a little seasoning at the end. It's like your salt to finish your meal. So very excited to use this. I'll go ahead and show you what it looks like and then we'll also get into how to actually use this. So this particular inoculating compost is called BioVast compost. Um, and again, I'm very excited to use this. Um, if you don't want to purchase it yourself, um, you can actually make an inoculating compost on your own. Um, this is a very common popular tactic for KNF, Korean natural farming, where they use IMOs, indigenous microorganisms, to create a very um, alive compost mixture, which they can then use in teas and extracts to spread around their garden. So I haven't actually gotten into that yet. It's something that I've been wanting to try, but I just felt like I need to learn one thing at a time. So this is gonna be my opportunity to kind of get into it and learn what this actually does for my garden. So now we've talked about the four different major types of compost, and I wanted to now focus on the inoculating compost, the one that I was very excited about earlier. So what we're gonna to do today is something that I've personally never done before. I am not an expert on. I've read about it. I've listened to some podcasts, watched some videos on it. But this is absolutely the first time I'm doing anything like this, and that is making compost extract or tea. And the reason why you do this is that it's to take something like this, which is, you know, on the pricier end, but extremely beneficial and good for the garden, and try to magnify this. And I messaged uh, Andy over at SD Microbes, and he mentioned that a 1.5 cubic foot bag of this is enough to 
apply tea to five acres of property. So this here should be way more than plenty for me to fully inoculate the three cubic yards of compost I just bought while also being able to inoculate my whole garden. So I'm very excited to hear that. So anyway, before we get into the compost brewing, um, there's a couple things that matter and that's the equipment. So this is a just a paint straining bag. I picked this up at a local hardware store. So that's what the compost is gonna sit in. It's gonna make the end product easier to separate and then apply. Um, I got some of this by recommendation from somebody at a hydroponic store. It's a catalyst that has things that fungal populations like to feed on, things such as oat bran, sea kelp, wheat malt, and it has a little bit of molasses. Um, again, I'm not gonna get too into these details because that's an entire video on its own. And I'm also not an expert. So maybe in a few months after I've practiced this, um, I'll go ahead and do a video, uh, maybe a full guide, and we could really figure out how this works and my thoughts on it then. But for now, I'm just gonna do it. I'm not sure if I'm doing it entirely right, but we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> so what I pulled out is this is a, um, air pump. This is what's normally used for an aquarium and these are two air stones. So the idea is that this pumps air in through here. The stone diffuses the air and it creates a ton of bubbles. Um, I'm going to use quarter inch irrigation line to connect these and this has two outlets. So the basic idea is you take some compost, put it in here, throw it in your container, put water in here and there's a special caveat and we'll go over why I have this measuring cup on the water in a moment here but you take your compost, put it in there. You might throw in a little bonus thing like this, uh, totally optional, don't need it whatsoever. Then you drop your two air stones in and you let it brew. And the reason why you're putting the air in is the air is agitating, so it's creating the mixture and it's also providing oxygen so that the actual contents of the brew doesn't go anoxic, so no oxygen. And that is an important thing because if you do create an anaerobic environment, you could start propagating things that aren't beneficial to your garden, things that do grow in a low or no oxygen environment. So you wanna at least provide some sort of oxygen during the whole process to try to inhibit the growth of anything like that. So anyway, let's get into the actual process. And before I set all this up, I'm gonna talk about the water now. So in here I have about two to three gallons of filtered water. And um, I did just recently install a garden water filter Again, that's gonna be a topic for another video. It's something brand new, so I don't have much to say on it. But basically, whenever you're brewing a active tea like this, you wanna make sure that you don't have any chlorine or chloramine. Now chlorine is, if you only have chlorine in your water, that's totally doable. You could just let a bucket of water sit out overnight and most of the chlorine will off gas, but chloramine won't and it needs to be filtered out. Unfortunately, I checked with my local water municipality and our water does have some chloramine in it. So I decided to get the filter. Um, but anyway, uh, what I have here is a chlorine test strip. And so in here I have the water that I just filtered with my new garden water filter. And then in this cup here, I have just straight tap water. So I wanna do a quick test of the chlorine and see and make sure that A, I actually do have chlorine in my water <laughs> and B, that the filter is actually removing that chlorine effectively. All right, so there are the two test strips. I'm gonna go ahead and do the tap water. One, two, three. Hold it level, then do the filtered water, one, two, three, and hold the level. All right, so, I don't know if the color is gonna come out very cleanly, but the one that's uh, closer to my thumb there is the straight tap water. So already I could see that it definitely has chlorine. It's probably somewhere in the three, to five parts per million range. Um, whereas the one that I just filtered has none. So the test is zero. The color basically didn't change. So that's step one complete. Now we could go ahead and get the brewing going. I decided to take the straining bag out for now and I'll actually just strain everything at the end. I think it'll work better if everything's allowed to kind of just bounce around in the water more freely. So there's about a little over half a pound of the biovas compost. And like I said, this is like probably two and a half gallons of water. Um, Andy recommended about a half pound to five gallons, but for a more concentrated tea, you could just do a higher ratio of compost. So that's what I'm gonna just go for today. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead, turn on the air pumps, start getting the mixing and oxygen going, and then I'm gonna just dump this in. 
At least I'm pretty sure that's all I have to do. I might try to help give it a stir. Um, one thing I'll note is that I was recommended to have the air pump above the water. That way, if anything happens, like if power shuts off, the water won't go back into the pump and ruin it. So that's why I have this elevated here. So I'm gonna just actually try to take one of these air stones, just kind of swirl it around. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to do this. Um, this was not the method uh, Andy recommended. He recommended something called like a type of pump called an airlift pump, um, but I already had this on hand, so I decided to just go ahead and do this instead. This might not be as effective. Some people get really, really intense about compost brewing. Um, it's what I've noticed in doing research, but I'm brand new to this. So for me, this seems perfectly adequate. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and add that six teaspoons of catalyst. And yeah, so basically I'm gonna just let this brew. Uh, it's recommended for a compost tea to do 12 to 24 hours. Um, there's something called an extract, which is like a quick soak. So you're not really propagating things as much, you're more just kind of extracting it. And that's a two to four hour brew. So I'm not entirely sure what I'm gonna end up with today. I might just try to do an extract off of this, um, but yeah, we'll see, check back later. So Tefra and I have now been patiently waiting for four hours. I'm gonna go ahead and call it. This is gonna be more of an extract rather than a tea since I only had it in there for four hours but I really just want to try it. So I'm going to go ahead and strain this and then go try to apply it to different parts of the garden. And next time I will do a full 24 hour brew, but I just realized that my timing tomorrow morning, I don't really have time to deal with this. So we're going to stick with an extract for today. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and deactivate this. And I'm going to go ahead and bring this paint strainer into action. I have <laughs> no idea how it's going to work or if it'll work, um, but let's find out. All right, so I know cleanliness is important here. Um, both of these buckets haven't been used for anything else before, so that's a good start. Um, but basically what I'm gonna do now is pour this bucket into here, where hopefully this mesh will filter the majority of it. Um, and then I've decided that anything that's in the little straining sock um, it probably still has a lot of life in it. So I'm going to go ahead and take the remains of this compost and just throw it into my compost bin. And basically with the idea of that inoculating my compost. All right, so let's do this. A lot of it's actually still inside the bucket here. I'm gonna go ahead and give that a squeeze because that seems like a good idea. All right. Okay, so that's what's left. And it's gonna be hard to tell since it's a black bucket, but now I have this nice brown liquid. So hopefully this is full of a lot of beneficial life. Um, now we're gonna figure out how we're gonna actually apply it to the garden. So I just did a little test with that little hose on siphon and I'm not convinced that it's actually siphoning fast enough. So I'm gonna switch to my old reliable, which is the EZ flow. Um, the way this works is basically you fill it um, often. I mean, the only way I've used this before since I've never made compost tea before is I fill this with a liquid organic fertilizer. And then you put this little guy on top and it lets you select how fast it's releasing fertilizer from slow to one to two to fast. So I have it on fast right now since this is already basically a, a dilute fertilizer. Um, screw it on and what's gonna happen is as the water comes through here, it's going to pressurize this vessel and then force some of it to come back into the stream. So as I'm watering, it's definitely going to be siphoning out the material and you could tell because this line color will be the color of whatever's in here. So you know that it's actually moving through. Um, the other reason I really like this is that it comes with these little pressure reducing rings. And what that means is that I could actually use this on my drip irrigation. So even though my drip irrigation doesn't flow very fast, this is still able to siphon up and inject fertilizer wherever I want. So I'm going to fill this right now, go water in that three cubic yards of compost. And then once I've done that for maybe 10, 15 minutes, I'm going to go ahead and run it through my drip 
in this garden and then run it through my drip in the other garden. So that way I'm going to basically try to use this as much as I can and inoculate my whole garden as fast and easy as I can. It doesn't really get any easier than this, honestly. You just put your stuff in here, turn on the timer, which I have hooked up in line, and I use two quick connects from Hoselink. So I only have to buy one of these, one of these, one of the backflow preventers, and then I just go around quick swapping, quick connecting in across my garden. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. All right, so usually I'll put this whole quick connect system over by the faucet um, so that it's not this awkward, but I'm going to leave it here so that I can just show you guys what's gonna happen. So what I'm gonna do is turn on the water. And as I do that, what's gonna, what you're gonna see is that this line is going to turn brown. And there it is. So that's brown. So I know now, for example, that the, the water is actually siphoning through there and it is actually drawing that compost tea into the system. So now the water that's coming out right here is actually loaded with that compost tea. So here's the easy flow setup on my drip line irrigation. Um, so this part of the garden, I don't have any way to get PVC over there easily. So what I do is I take my hose link and I quick connect to my drip main line right here. But since I want to fertilize or inject, or in this case inoculate, um, I have the quick connect to a timer, which is set for two hours, to a backflow preventer, to the easy flow siphon, and then quick connect it to my drip line. So now I'm just going to walk away for two hours. And after the two hours, the color in this line is going to start becoming a lot more faded. And that's because this is getting diluted constantly as, this is, as the water is flowing through. So that's how you kind of know that it's actually working is that the color, whatever you're putting in here basically should have some color and the color will become faded over time. So now this is the, the fun slash boring part is going to be actually applying this. Um, I'm going to do this by hand over here just because um, I don't have drip system on this. <laughs> but I want to try to impart as much of this material in here as I can. Um, one thing that I should probably mention is that I have already been watering this pile. And that's important because if I was just to dump the solution onto dry compost, it's going to have to do double duty. First, it's going to have to rehydrate. and there's not gonna be anywhere for all those beneficials to wanna to live and thrive. So this has already been pre-wet some, somewhat, and now I'm just basically inoculating this pile. So I've taken that inoculating compost, I've put it into a solution, and now I'm inoculating this nutritional compost. So basically I'm supercharging this compost by using a very small amount of the other one. So this is the best use case I could think of because now instead of just having a five gallon bag, of inoculating compost, this whole pile will begin to be inoculated. So that's really all there is to it, guys. Uh, after this, I'm gonna run it through all my drip and get my whole garden inoculated as best I can. And over the next couple months, I'll keep you guys updated. But I think that's all we have to talk about today. So with all that in mind, I just wanna say thanks. If you guys enjoyed this video, if you learned something, please give it a like. If you haven't subscribed, you know, please do because there's going to be a lot more and you guys are going to want to see the update in a few months on how this worked. So thank you and Garden Hermits out.